welcome back to Season 5 of the Changing Earth Podcast with Sarah F. Hathaway. Blending survival fiction and fact to bring you entertaining education that will help you dream, survive, and thrive. And now, here's your host, Sarah F. Hathaway. Hey guys, what is up? Welcome back to the Changing Earth Podcast. This is episode number 188, if you can believe that. We're getting deep into the shows now. Season 5, episode 25. So, story is really getting rocking. You know, Dark Days in Denver really takes off from here. So, I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the story. We got some exciting stuff coming up. But today, uh, I have a really a laundry list of things to talk to you about. Uh, we've been having some crazy winter weather here in California. I think uh, as of late, we have the most snow of any state in the country. So, that's just crazy in and of itself right there. So some great water coming down in California. Um, we should be able to use that throughout the summer as long as the, you know, powers that be manage their resources wisely, um, which should be looking pretty good. So crazy winter weather going on. It's been cold. It's been snowing at my house. Uh, it's not something we get a lot of, and usually it melts by noon. It's actually been sticking around for a little bit. So uh, exciting, you know, and uh, get, it makes it scary to drive on the mountain roads, though. I do got to say that. Tahoe was pretty much shut down. Some crazy stuff going on. Okay, so uh, Patreon members, thank you very much for all your support, all you do. However, I have heard some disturbing news of Patreon over the past few months and about them censor- censoring users and things like that. So I really want to um, get away from using their services and I'm available to offer that same service directly through my website. Uh, it's a better deal for me and uh, just works out a lot easier. So head on over. If you're a current Patreon subscriber, head on over to authorsarahfhathaway.com backslash support. I have the same exact plans over there. And I actually made some of them a little bit cushier um, because, you know, come straight into my website so I can do a little bit more for you because I'm cutting out the middleman. So um, head on over again if you'd like to become a supporter. I really appreciate that. It's what keeps the changing earth world turning over here. And that's at authorsarahfhathaway.com backslash support. So we're going to be switching everything over there. And I'm going to be taking my business away from Patreon um, just because I'm really not thrilled with what they've been doing. And if you're curious what I'm talking about over on my Patreon account, I have a post explaining everything and directing you to a really great video of, uh, you know, what's been going on with Patreon and, and the stuff they're trying to pull. And, uh, you know, they're pushing eventually to, um, have rights to the user's content and there's no way I'm going to do that. So I figure I'll just get out of the game now. So please keep continuing to show your support, head on over to my website to get that done. Uh, let's see Yellowstone. Yellowstone is worth checking out right now. Um, even if you're, you know, um, not, fe- I'm not fear mongering or anything. I mean, eruptions always possible, uh, because it is a volcano, right? But there's been some really interesting, just earth changes and stuff going on over there. It's definitely up my alley. It's what I like to check out. And, uh, so a lot of the, uh, steamboat geyser has erupted a record amount of times in 2018. It's still going in 2019. Um, uh, a geyser that hasn't erupted for like 80 years erupted. I can't remember the name specifically of that one. Um, they're having lots of, you know, earth earthquakes over there and just ground up lift and stuff like that. So really interesting stuff to check out if you're into uh, following, you know, planetary changes and, and things like that. Um, I'm going to try and bring a few more of those um, avenues that I kind of study and look at the material that I study to put my books together and stuff like that for you because um, I find it fascinating what's going on. Um, If you haven't looked into the polar shifts yet, they just had to move Magnetic North again because they're shifting faster than what they thought. So you should be checking that out and you should be up on uh, some of your earth changes, you know, here on the Changing Earth. Um, Today's show, so last week in Dark Days in Denver, the battle began. And this week, visibility is just collapsing because there's so much chaos going on. There's a volcano erupting. There's, you know, chaos going on within the city. The earthquakes are taking buildings down and stuff like that. So lots of dust, particles, things in the air. Visibility is really hard and they have to rely on their compasses. So today I have L. Douglas Hogan back on the show. First time on season five, but 
guest on my show for a long time and it's always fun to get to sit down with Doug and you know uh, shoot the stuff back and forth and uh, definitely a pleasure to have him on the show but we're going to be talking about using compasses how to properly do that and so you know you're going to get a you're going to get a great show on the podcast it's going to be a lot of fun however I have a YouTube video on it and he has graphics and things like that and so the YouTube video might be worth your while to check out this week because um, it is a little bit more explanative or explanatory, I guess. <laughs> does a better job of explaining how to use the compass over there because of those graphics and things like that. So head on over there, check that out. YouTube, The Changing Earth, of course, and you'll find me and all my goodies. And uh, you, there's a link through my website on the survival guide, so you can check it out there too. Don't forget the preparedness experience hosted by my good buddy, Dale Goodwin is coming up, and that is March 22nd through March 24th, and that is happening down in Las Vegas. They are going to have some spectacular educational material down there. Uh, Matthew Stein's going to be down there, Ross Powell, Kevin Reeder from my show, Todd Sepulva, Chris Weatherman's going to be there. Of course, Dale's going to be there. Brian Duff from my show is going to be there, the host of Mind for Survival. And Ryan Mitchell from The Tiny Life is going to be out there with a bunch of more guests. They have some super cool learning experiences going on. Um, everything from wound care to emergency medical care. Um, just a myriad making your survival binder, you know, getting organized and uh, just a myriad of topics that are going to be going on there. I'm getting down there myself, so I really hope to see you out there. Um, it's my game plan to be there in uh, March in Las Vegas, and I can't wait to see you out there. So I just want to remind you that that is coming up. You got to get your tickets now because they are going fast, and seating is limited there. This is not an expo where everybody's welcome. This is a private event where you will be a guest there. So you got to get a hold of your tickets right now. It is www.thepreparednessexperience.com. That's www.thepreparednessexperience.com. So get yourself over there and get hooked up with those tickets. They are going fast and I'm just happy to have my seat reserved already. So I hope to see you out there. And uh, remember that's www.thepreparednessexperience.com. Get your tickets and I'll see you in Vegas. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and get into chapter 25 of Dark Days and Dead Men. Chapter 25. As the night wore on, the endless noise of gunfire filled Erica's mind. The flashing lights illuminated the dust thick in the air. They gripped the ground as aftershocks shook them to the core. Erica noticed that if she could continue to shoot through the shaking, the advantage was hers. But her accuracy was terrible. You're just wasting ammo, Vince told her as her legs rode the wave of the earth. No, I got a couple, she yelled back. Erica crashed down next to Vince into a pile of dust particles. The whiteness flew up around her. This stuff is getting thick, she told him. The sun was coming up, but it did little to help the visibility. That's why I told you to keep your mask on, Cupcake, Bennett told her as he approached at a low ready. Do you think it's from the quakes, or is it Yellowstone? Erica asked. Both, he replied, firing a shot at a soldier approaching down the barricade. Lieutenant Colonel Virgis radioed me. It's true. Yellowstone is erupting. Holy shit, Vince replied, sitting back on his heels. Please, God, take care of my parents, he prayed. Erica fired more shots out. What's the plan, she wondered. The mercenary army is cutting them in half. We have to wait, Bennett replied. I doubt the planes will go up in the morning. The feds can't risk it. Just then his radio sounded. It was Lieutenant Colonel Virgis on the other end. Massive amounts of federal reinforcements are coming from the airport. The mission is FUBAR. We're headed your way. The radio sounded and then filled with crackling. We'll be ready for you, sir, Bennett yelled back into the black box. Kyle, go down the line and tell them to be on the lookout for the mercenary army headed this way, Bennett commanded. Wait here, I'll be back he told Vince and Erica as he took off down the line of volunteers. Another quake shook the ground furiously and the foundation of the best western cracked loudly. Vince and Erica looked to one another and ran to the south as the building gave way and came crashing to the ground. The dust joined with the volcanic ash in the air and covered Vince and Erica in a shroud of darkness. 
Erica, Staff Sergeant Gleason yelled. Over here, Erica replied through the dust. Vince found her as well when Erica called out, and she felt him grabbing her hand in the cloud. There you are, Victoria declared, approaching with Kyle. Nickleton and Cassidy are east of here. Let's go, Kyle said, urging them forward through the haze. The dust was so thick they could barely see in front of their face. The gunfire had quieted around them, and the shroud bore down heavily. They were ever vigilant with their rifles, never knowing if they were going to run into feds or friendlies. Hey guys, Darren remarked as they approached a large number of militia members. Glad you made it. I'm all turned around in this haze. We're trying to get to Master Gunnery Sergeant Nickleton, Erica explained. Use your compass. They are east of our position, holding the northern front, Darren told them. Kyle led the charge forward. Victoria, Erica, and Vince formed the wedge behind them. I hope Bennett is okay, Erica told Vince. Focus, baby. We need to be on point, Vince reminded her. I'm on it, Erica said, focusing her mind on the threat in the haze rather than the whereabouts of her loved ones. As they crept along, they heard a group of voices up ahead in the shroud of dust. Kyle motioned to them with a questioning look. He couldn't tell if they were friendlies or not either. They slowly stalked the voices. Peering out from behind the corner of an old building, they saw the federal uniforms. Erica signaled for them to spread out in a U-shape. When she gave the signal, they opened fire. The federal soldiers never saw it coming from the dusty veil. Erica stepped over the fallen soldiers. Her heart ached for them. If only they could have settled the future of our country with talk rather than violence. There was no going back to the federal system now. It would be the death of her for sure. Looking up to make certain she was with her team, Erica saw a laser light shooting through the haze directly behind Vince. Sniper, Erica warned quietly. The team hit the deck, watching another laser sight trying to find the target in the mist. They scrambled on past the red lines, cutting through the dust. As they neared the eastern side of Centennial, the sound of gunfire picked up again. They made their way to a group of buildings that the militia were fortifying heavily. As they approached, Bennett found them. Oh, thank God you guys are okay, Bennett said, approaching them with a wide grin. He wrapped his arms around Erica, giving her a tight squeeze, and then wrapped his arm around Vince in a bro hug. When I saw that building come down, I just about puked, Bennett told them. We couldn't see a thing, Erica replied, catching her breath. We've got a whole team of snipers that have moved into those buildings over there, Bennett informed them, pointing out into the haze. We ran into them. They're not using thermals or we would have been goners for sure, Erica admitted. Has Lieutenant Colonel Virgis's team made it back yet? Vince wondered. No, they're okay though. The dust has changed the situation. They were able to press back in on the flank and are having some success now, Bennett assured him. Another aftershock's coming, Erica told them, knowing the feeling of the air before the quake. True to her prediction, the ground started trembling, causing four of the surrounding buildings to come down. They heard screams in the distance from some of the snipers who fell with the buildings. Well, I guess that's one way to take care of them, Bennett chuckled. Let's dig in and help hold the line. Yes, sir, they responded, spreading out behind a wall of concrete to wait again. The line was held easily for a couple of hours. Few federal soldiers made it through. They even took a moment to munch on a pemmican bar that they prepared for the long battle they were expecting. Pulling the gas mass up, they would take a bite and then cover their faces again to chew. The full light of day was now upon them, but it made little difference. The sky illuminated in a sickening orange haze and the volcanic ash continued to fall. There was a thick layer that covered everything in about a foot of the dust. How we doing over here, guys? Cassidy asked, approaching out of nowhere. We're still kicking, Erica answered. Where have you been? Playing mediator with commanding forces. It's the worst part of this job, Cassidy chuckled. Feel free to join in the fight, Vince commented, greeting Eli, Patrick, and most of her team. Where's Ned? Erica wondered. Took one to the leg, Eli answered. He'll be fine. What about Star? Cassidy wondered. Bullet to the ear. Good thing, too. One inch over and I wouldn't have a daughter anymore, Erica fretted. Glad she'll be okay, Cassidy agreed. Nickleton came running over to them through the fog. The feds have a large group of reinforcements headed our way. It's going to get real again, quick. Get ready, people, he commanded. Yes, sir, they replied, packing up their canteens and provisions. He continued down the line, talking with the commanders of the units. They never saw him return to his post as the wave of federal forces fell on them. 
They were held at bay with grenade launchers that the mercenaries supplied to the militia, but soon they ran out of ammo. The ground before them looked like it was Swiss cheese, and the feds took advantage of the new landscape to hide from the barrage of gunfire. The bullets whizzed over their heads. Erica dared not peek above the concrete bags as the chips joined the dust in the air. She watched the sniper lasers searching the area behind them. Slowly crawling on her belly through the white volcanic ash, Erica made her way to Vince's side. We're pinned, she told him, pointing to the red lights. They'll run low on ammo soon, Vince assured her, hoping it was true. Bennett's radio crackled with news of additional federal soldiers pushing the western front back again. He looked at them with concerned eyes as he hugged the ground behind the bags. Another quake, Erica yelled to the team. As the ground began to ripple, Erica heard the shooting stop. The feds were put off guard by the thunder of the ground upheaving. Erica stood up and fired out into the haze with her rifle sounding off above the roar of the quake. She heard men screaming from the hole she was firing at as Bennett ripped her back to the ground. Are you crazy, woman? He shouted at her. The quaking began to quiet, and the bullet barrage continued. The radio sounded again. From what Erica heard, the battle was not going well for the mercenary forces. Her ears perked up as a voice she hadn't heard before lit up the airwaves. Attention all American traitors, it began. Erica looked at Vince, disgusted by what the feds called them. We know you have Erica Moore with you. We're willing to leave the West if you are willing to trade her for it. You have one hour to decide. Erica's heart pounded out of her chest. How did I ever end up here, she wondered. Vince looked at her. His eyes were wild at their request. Bennett was still staring at the radio in disbelief. What will Merkley do? Erica questioned Bennett. He looked at her with indecision in his eyes. He doesn't know either, she thought to herself. He won't do anything, Cassidy insisted. It's not his call alone, and there is no way we would agree to hand you over to the feds. Erica looked at her with relief, but then a loud megaphone sounded from the federal soldiers standing off with them. We know Erica Moore is over there. This can all be over if you walk her over to us, they demanded. If you want her, come and get her, Cassidy cried, kneeling to fire a magazine of bullets out at them. Eli tried to pull her down immediately, but Cassidy stood her ground. Erica watched a laser appear on her forehead. Cassidy, she cried as Cassidy's skull exploded like a melon. As chapter 25 comes to a close, Cassidy's character is eliminated from the story. And, you know, it really broke my heart to eliminate this character, but I introduced Gear, and uh, so it was, you know, just kind of how it goes with drama. And we can all shed our tears for Cassidy because she was a super cool character to have in the story. So take care, Cassidy. In the meantime, the characters in the story had this limited visibility, and they really had to rely upon their compass to be able to get to where they needed to go and find Bennett and get back with the group and everything. So here today to talk about how to properly use a compass is L. Douglas Hogan. L. Douglas Hogan is the author of the Tyrant series. He's been featured on seasons two, three, four, and five. L. Douglas Hogan is a USMC veteran with over 20 years in public service. Among these are three years as an anti-tank infantryman, one year as a Marine Corps marksmanship instructor, 10 years as a part-time police officer, and 17 years working in state government doing security work and supervision. He is the best-selling author of Oath Takers and has authored four books in a series titled Tyrant. I think he's got a lot more by now. Um, this bio is a little bit older. And he's working on the sixth and final book of the series. So he not only has that series, he's got another one out now too. He'll talk to you about that when he's on the show. But he's been married for over 20 years. He has two children and he's faithful to his church where he resides in Southern Illinois. If you would like to get a hold of Doug, you can do so at www.ldouglashogan.com. That's www.ldouglashogan.com. So let's go ahead and welcome Doug to the show. Today, I am super stoked to be back with my good buddy, Doug Hogan. Doug, thanks so much for coming on the show. I don't th really think I need to go through a huge introduction here for you. Hey, thanks for having me back, Sarah. Uh, no need for a lengthy introduction. <laughs> right. 
why don't you know you got some uh you know you got lots of good books out already and uh so go ahead and give your plug on your books and where people can find you because that's always so important okay sure um uh, my bestseller it's been bestseller several times on amazon is oath takers it's actually the first book that i wrote it's a non-fiction book it's uh it's geared towards any any patriot really uh you, anybody that's uh, sworn an oath, uh, any kind of patriot that's sworn an oath, any kind of individual that uh, supports individuals who uh, swear oaths, um, it's very opinionated, kind of like an opinion uh, opinionated education book. So um, it's going to have some some uh, uh, some of my leading opinions in it, but uh, it's got uh, some pretty decent reviews, and uh, I love it. Uh, it's one I push quite often. And it was also kind of a predecessor towards my fiction series, the Tyrant series, which uh, came out uh, just a few months after I did Oath Takers, which is completely fiction. And it's a, uh, it's a, uh, I call it faction. It's, it's fact-based fiction. Right. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it was written with some actual um, f factual things that's uh, alive and well in our world still today. Um, executive orders, you know, the Agenda 21, that's not a, a conspiracy theory that a lot of people might think that it is. Um, and other things like that. And I just take all these things, all these elements that are true and bring them into uh, kind of a, its own little universe, fictional universe, and uh, plot out uh, characters and the course that, that I believe that the United States is going to take if uh, the people who have sworn an oath to the Constitution to uphold the Constitution don't uphold the Constitution. Essentially what you're going to have is a sliding scenario, you know, where the globalists come in and, and the United Nations and uh, what we don't want here in the United States is to give our freedoms up to a bunch of globalists, because when that happens, we'll cease to be Americans altogether, and we can kiss our freedoms goodbye. Yeah, you educated me, my little brain there on all the executive orders, and I got to tell you, when Trump was like, oh, the shutdown, it could be a national disaster, I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> national disaster. We do not want to proclaim a national disaster. Like People have no idea what the ramifications of that move would be. I'm like... Not a good idea. And if listeners don't know what I'm talking about, you need to go back in the series and listen to the episode that we did on the executive orders because there is some scary material there. And uh, you need to educate yourself on that one. And unfortunately, they have been taken down off of uh, the government archive either. Like they're still up there. You go to, um, uh, what is it, um, U.S. I don't know if I forget what it is right now, but it's archives.gov, I think is what it is, archives.gov. And all the executive orders that's ever been written is put up there. So if you ever hear some kind of conspiracy theorists talk about, you know, this executive order, that executive order, just go look it up. It's easy, you know, plug in executive order 36603 uh, or something. I can't remember what the, the Obama's uh, big, big one oh, was. Big one. Yeah. yeah, the big, the big, big one. <laughs> um, but it, it'll pull it up and you'll see, you can read it with your own eyes what it is. Um, so... There's that, and uh, uh, I kind of did a couple spinoffs from that that I could be considered in the Tyrant series. They used some characters from that. I wrote a, a zombie uh, crossover genre that's post apoc zombie-esque, and um, my new series I just started is After the Pulse, and I released uh, book one, Homestead, um, last September, and I'm currently working on uh, Deadfall, which would be book two in the After the Pulse uh uh, series that one uh I, I with that story and for those who are not familiar with the homestead uh, s uh story you know it starts out i started out kind of simple with just a dude and his family you know um they don't really know too much what's going on in the outside world they've been kind of um secluded on their homestead since a massive emp took out the nation's uh, electrical grid and it's it's just start what i'm not going to talk about is what's in book two but things begin to pick up and escalate as they get more exposure to the everything outside of their their comfort zone. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a dysfunctional family. I designed it that way. People um, have complained um, that uh, there's a lot of idiots in the book. I wrote them that way on purpose <laughs> because I, and it's just my belief that in a really post uh, situation, not everybody that we write about, you know, that we meet is going to know everything there is to know about surviving. There's going to be people out there that are absolute buffoons. <laughs> right. Um, and and your somehow family. they make it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and your family's going, and there's, there's real family issues. And people are going to be fighting. They're going to be arguing and squabbling. There's going to be, you yeah. know, home drama and stuff. And I bring all that into the story. So yeah. You know, sometimes that. those characters are the best way to show you, like, what not to be, <laughs> you know? Yep. <laughs> I actually have learned a lot in my life from, from people who have done wrong, you know, like bad yep. leaders. I learned from them. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Me too. All right, so in this chapter of Dark Days in Denver, my team is deep in the battle in Denver. 
and uh, the earthquakes are going on, Yellowstone starts erupting. So vision is very limited. It's this atmosphere of dust, basically, and ash that's falling from the sky. Everybody's in gas masks and things like that. And uh, so they start relying on their compass heavily to get to find their team where they need to go and things like that. So the compass, it seems like it's nice and easy, right? You just point north and there you go, right? But not so much. And uh, so I really wanted to do an episode. I've never done an episode on how to properly use a compass. And uh, I knew you were good. You were the guy for the task. So what type of compass do you recommend that we carry like in our go bag we have on us all the time? Well, I am absolutely dead set. I mean, there's a lot of good compasses out there. There's a lot of people out there that are into land navigation and, um, and land orienteering and stuff like that. And I'm not saying that, that this is the be all end all, but for me it is, you know, um, and it's the Kaminga uh, compass. It's a model 27 Kaminga compass specifically. I'm just gonna show it to the camera here. And I know there's some people out there that are listening and not watching this on YouTube, but um, what we have here is just a, it's a, it's just a classic old military compass. And this compass has withstood the test of time. It's battle tested. Um, you know, our soldiers and the Marines use this in, in, in boot camp and training. When they go to combat, they, they use this. And uh, it's the reason why it works so well, or the reason why they, they're still using it, because it works so well. There's no reason to reinvent the wheel, right? This thing's got right. basically everything on it that you need um, to navigate around uh, on land. Um, and this could be used um, by itself or with a map. And that's it's got some awesome features that I think are, are really cool. So again, okay. that's the uh, Model 27 Kaminga. So what is the proper way to actually hold your compass? Like, how do you do this? Okay, so the one thing with the compass is, um, and, and every compass is like this, unless you're dealing with a digital compass, is uh, a there's, digital there's a digital compass. <laughs> yeah, now, is there a there battery are... in that sucker? Uh, well, let's talk about like if there's an EMP, right? You're going to oh, be right? without a digital yeah. compass. But I have uh, seen people with their phones out in the mountains. I do a lot uh, of hiking, you know, and they have their phones out. And they're just pointing that thing around, you know, oh, no. um, getting their little readings and stuff. But incredibly inaccurate. Um, okay, so um, there is actually a fr there's there's actually a free floating dial inside of the compass. Um, if it's a good compass, um, there's a, a usually water or some kind of a, a wet. Uh, stuff that's I think it's well, I believe it's water that's inside of the, the compass and inside of the compass there's a magnet all right so it's important um because this dial is floating around inside this water that you hold the compass straight all right so if you hold it at an angle and I'm showing the camera that if you, you know if you point it up and hold it at an angle the dial actually stops moving in there and you you know it gets stuck wow. and it won't spin so the north will stay pointed whatever direction it is whenever it gets stuck on on the lens or the bottom of, uh, of the compass. So the best okay. way to hold the compass is to is to make sure that it's flat. And it, depending on what kind of compass you have, like I have this uh, this rear sight uh, with a magnifying lens right here, and I'm holding up to the camera for the people that can't see. And there's a little slot on top of this thing right there. Um, and the, the point for that is, is because on the other side of the compass, there's a wire inside of there. And uh, you when you're when you're orienting um, your compass and your compass is horizontal or par I'm sorry, parallel to the to the ground and it's not catching and the dial is floating in there you can look inside your 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 magnification lens and line that little line those two lines up with something in the distance and so and that's how you properly hold a compass just make sure that it's flat and it's pointed in the direction um, that you're supposed to be traveling in so that the um, the dial is free floating and it's not sticking inside of there so you said there's a magnet in there and uh, I you know a lot of people will put their map down on their car and then put the compass on top of the map. And uh, there's a lot of magnetic things in your vehicle. So does that that mess with it? Well, if you are driving around and you have um, uh, your your compass close enough to something metal in your vehicle, it will because the, the magnet on your on your compass is on the north end, right? It's so the, the you got northeast, south and west inside your compass. And the, the magnet, magnetized area is on the northern arm or northern um, part of, of the compass. So it's always going to port, point north. Um, however, it won't point anywhere if it's touching metal. So um, oh, if okay. I, can, I would demonstrate, but I don't have no metal on me. And, well, yeah, I do. I got, how's this? I got a knife. Well, there you go. All right. 
So the American, I can't show you anyway because I'll tip it up and get the freezers. Oh, uh, fair uh, enough. Yeah, I know. Uh -huh. But so if I was to set this on my my metal knife or set this on a metal object, um, my compass is going to lock up and it won't move because okay. that magnet is picking up the metal. And all magnets are designed that way. They 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 lock up, they freeze, they attach to something metallic. And so it's okay to set your your compass on the ground. It's okay to set it on a brick or it's okay to set it on anything really. Um, just make sure that you're not setting it on metal or something that's rich in something like iron that will, would stop it from, um, from rotating. Yeah. There's some rocks and whatnot that would have that kind of, uh, material in it. So heads yeah, up and, on that one. And you, yeah. and you could tell, you know, just by, if you move your compass around a little bit, if you set it down on something to, to see if it's, uh, if there's something inside of there, cause it won't move, it'll stay still. Okay. So how do you actually know what direction you're going by lining up those two little areas and looking out at the point in the distance? Well, if you look down on your um, on the Lizetic compass, there is um, here um, again, I'm going to show the viewers, but I know there's people at home that, that can't see this. But on, on your compass lens, there's a line. Um, can you see it on top yep. here? There's a line that goes straight up and down. Yep. That that right there is the marker that you're looking for. All right, so inside of a compass, there's going to be um, mils and there's going to be degrees. We as Americans utilize the degrees, right? So right. Um, if we're heading towards a certain area, so I got close to my computer there and there's metal in it, so it stopped moving <laughs> on me. But uh, so if I'm if I want to head, um, say say straight east, I have to move my my uh, have to move my compass around until that black line on my on my lens and east are perfectly lined up. And once they're perfectly lined up, I know that I'm going east. If I need to go 240 degrees, um, then I have to look down at the, at the little red uh, degree markings and turn my, my compass until I am facing 240 degrees. And once those, that line and the 240 degrees line up, that's the direction that I go. And I just okay. keep walking in that direction. Very cool. Because I'm always like, you know, you can't just point the compass and, and follow it. So well, and there are people that are generally confused by it because they'll see north and they'll, they'll, they're trying to follow the north, um, the north arm of the of the compass, right? So they're 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 turning and trying to head towards it. Just to, no, you're, they're only going to go north when they do that. And I swear, right. I, I've known people like that. <laughs> They're trying and to follow that. Saying. You can't, you can't just like point that thing. You got to actually know like what you're looking at. You can't just yes. be like, oh. Here we go. We're going north always. <laughs> so what is the difference I've heard about magnetic north and true north? So now, of course, we had to complicate things further. So this is where you start getting into a tricky part of land navigation. All right. And so mm -hmm. magnetic north is where like the north pole is located. All right. Um, so if you have magnetic north, that's this every every reading that your compass gives you is always magnetic north. Forget okay. about um, forget about true north. When you're dealing with a compass, it's always magnetic north, because your compass, like I said a while ago, is a magnet, and the north pole is magnetized. Correct. So um, whenever you that's what it's picking up on. It's there's a huge magnetic field in the Earth, um, because we have a, a, a an iron core, and that creates um, friction in the Earth, and it causes you know the, the Earth to have a, a magnetized whatnot. So yep, the atmosphere and it, everything. Yeah. Yep. So it will always draw towards the north. And uh, so mag magnetic north is exactly what that is. It's the, the exact spot on the north pole where um, our compass is pointing to. Okay. Um, true, now, true north is completely different. It has nothing to do at all with magnetic north. It has nothing to do with um, the north pole, believe it or not. <laughs> so if you open up um, an atlas and you see those, those um, the uh, I'm sorry, is well, uh, Longitude lines, the ones that run up and down across the earth, those yep. are straight lines that run from the bottom of the earth to the top of the earth. All right. If if I was to draw a line from the south pole or from the southernmost tip of the earth, a straight line right to the north, um, to the top of the earth, that is true north. But okay. here's something more confusing. There's a, there's a third north, believe it or not, and it's called grid north. So whenever you open up your map and you see the little the little cross lines on there, Mm -hmm. Those lines that run up and down on the map, that is grid north. And it's not the same as true north, believe it or not. Oh, like yes. we just had to get even worse? <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. So so um, 
All right, so let's take, you know, have you seen um, the atlases that they, um, so the, the pictures of the earth that they take and they open up and they flatten out so you can see the entire earth on a piece of paper, yes. right? Those lines are no longer straight, okay? Right. They're now going to be warped because what what looked like true north, when you open it up, it's warped out, all right? Right. So on a, it's not like that on a map. Um, on a map with grid north, those lines are always running up and down, you know, so, but, so if we take that and I fold it over, it's going to distort those lines those lines will then become will become warped Warped. yeah okay so on a map we're not dealing with true north we're dealing with grid north and magnetic north and so those are the two things when we're orienteering or land having that we have to keep in mind um grid north and magnetic north okay yeah that's uh that's the part that i always get stuck at i'm like darn it so that's where declination comes in right so you have yes. to Use your compass for declination so that you know where you're actually going if you're following a map. So yes. let's talk a little bit about how that works. Okay. So if you're using your compass, and um, let's just say you're, you, you need to go, um, say you're just traveling, all right, uh, and, and there's, no, there's really no need. Say you don't have a map. You're just traveling um, from, uh, you want to walk in a straight line because everybody knows that if you put your compass away, and uh, you got one dominant foot, right, and one one weaker foot. You're gonna walk in a circle eventually. That's right. just how it works. So you hear people on TV say, "Hey, we've been walking in circles." You know, it's more so. It's more prominent in the desert, believe it or not, because uh, the sand sinks. And so when you walk um, in, in, in deep sand, your prominent your prominent foot will always pull you, right? So you end up walking in a circle. Um, so, but if you say you're in a desert place and you have a compass with you, you can just you know point towards. And there's not a lot of objects in the desert, um, but you can, point, yeah. so you can, if you can find one super, if you can't, you, you need to mark something, um, uh, a dune or something in the, in the distance, you know, and, uh, and, and cite that out, you know, say you're, you went ahead, uh, uh, south because you're looking for, I don't know, water, for example. And so you point that south, um, you find something in the distance, um, you locate it, you put your, your compass away and you start walking towards that. However, if we're dealing with maps now and map orienteering, now we have now we're talking again about what well, I was talking about grid north and magnetic north. And if you look on the bottom of a map, and I'm, what I'm showing uh, to the viewers here is a declination diagram. But if you look on the bottom of, of most maps, they will have a declination diagram down there. And basically, what the declination diagram is doing is telling you it's got the grid lines on there, and it's also got a reading on there for magnetic north, true north, and grid north. All right, so you might see uh, your star is always going to be the true north on there, and it's going to be center. And then you're going to see, you know, either the magnetic north, the part with the one that's got a little arrow on it, is going to be leaning either either easterly or westerly, um, depending on where you're at in the world. All right, so okay. if you're, so so if you, um, or again, I'm I'm showing the viewers here. If you see here that um, that magnetic north is leaning westerly, all right. Yep, it's leading westerly, west, west, yep. it's leading west from true north and grid north. That is a negative declination, um, negative declination. So if you look at, if you look at your compass, there's what, 360 degrees on a compass, correct? Correct. So anything from 100 or one, zero degrees to, to 180 degrees is a, is a positive declination. Okay. Anything from 181 to 360 is a negative declination, all right? Um, because you got, you got. You start going to the other side then, right? Because er everything okay. is measured clockwise um, when you're reading when you're reading a compass. It's measured degrees are measured clockwise. So if you're looking at uh, your, the bottom of your comp your uh, your map down there, and you see that uh, magnetic north has a uh, has a negative declination on it of say this example that I showed um, shows 19 degrees west of of grid north. That means you have to add 19 degrees. To grid north to fix the declination. All right, so basically what it's showing you on that map is um, the difference between the grid that it's given you and the magnetic north of the pole. Because magnetic north, if somebody didn't cover all ago, magnetic north is never the same. I don't know if 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 you if you or your viewers or listeners know that, because the bang the the, the the magnetic north of the earth changes from time to time. Yes. So back back in the 1800s is a completely different location than it is today. So if you're using a map from 1980 that shows you the declinations, um, it's not going to be accurate. It's going to be incorrect oh. because magnetic north changes every so often. It's like five degrees um, 
every so often. I, I can't remember the exact uh, number right now, but it changes and it changes um, quite frequently. So the core shifts inside of the Earth, and when that happens, then the magnetic north changes. It's not true north. Magnetic north is rarely ever um, magnetic north is rarely ever uh, the same as true north. So uh, that being said, when you look on your map, you're going to see um, the difference. What you need to do to calculate the difference for magnetic north. And, and and grid north that it's giving you just to kind of sort things out because they're not the same. Okay. All right. So, so when you have bud, the right? negative one, we're actually adding it to it? Yes. If you Okay. okay. So if, if you look on your declination diagram and you see that magnetic north is to the east, is east okay. of, of your of grid north or true north, all right? Then you have to add because you got, I'm sorry, subtract. So okay. you got a, you got a positive declination. If it's if it's leading to the east, you need to add. I'm sorry, I'm gonna keep saying add. You need to mm -hmm. subtract. So you got a positive declination. You need to subtract the difference. Okay. To get get your magnetic uh, reading. To get it squared up so that you can yep. follow the map and the yep. grid lines there. Yep. Okay, that makes so sense. It's easy for the people like on the east coast, you know, because it's always gonna be the same because uh, uh, you're gonna have to subtract if you're living over there versus if you're living on the west coast. Um, and it's weird how it happens because the and this is going into a science that's way over my head, but it has something to do with the magnetic waves um, of the you know of the of the magnetic poles. All right, so they lean. I know that they lean inward on the east coast. So those those um, those readings lean inward on the east coast. They lean inward. Um, they both lean inward, but they're leaning uh, on the west coast. They're leaning uh, towards the east, and on the east coast, they're leaning towards the west. So okay. and again, you're going to have to go and do that study on your own. But that's why it's going to be pretty well fixed. If you're if you got it, uh, uh, you're almost always going to have a negative declination if you're on the West Coast and a positive declination if you're on the East Coast. OK. Yep. That's why it gets so confusing. My <laughs> so brain's just like, so you're just like, that's the part that you don't even really have to know and memorize anything. Like, just look at the declination. Some there's smart people somewhere when they make these grid, these maps, they put <laughs> declinations on there. All, right. all we have to do is look on there and see if the magnetic north, you know, the magnetic uh, uh, pull is, if it's uh, uh, got a, a positive declination or a negative declination. Then we Thank you, add, smart people somewhere, right? <laughs> somewhere. They do the hard work for us. So we just have to do the fixing. Okay, so we talked a little bit about um, using points if we didn't have a map to accurately travel in a direction. Um, so one of the things that I was reading about said like you can even send uh, somebody from your party out there to like be your spot out in the distance if you couldn't find something to kind of key into, you know, and then at least you'd know what direction you were traveling. And so let's kind of just combine this in with how do we take like a bearing? How do we figure out where we are? Where? Okay. So you want to know now we're, now we're trying to find out where we are mm -hmm. um, on, on a map. Okay. Yeah. This is the fun part. Um, so we don't know where we're at. We want to find where we're at. We have a map, correct? So right. in order to do that, we have to do what's called what's called a backward. First of all, let me, let me throw some terms out there. An azimuth. All right, is basically it's it's I learned this from it's a military term, but I believe it's widely used in the civilian world. And azimuth is a reading that you get um, from your compass. So if um, if I point my compass towards an object that I want to reach, and it says 240 degrees on it, then that's my azimuth reading, 240 degrees. All right, so um, 240 degrees is uh, is southwest is what it is. So um, I would point my compass 240 degrees south southwest and uh i'm trying to find a, a distance to walk right so you mentioned sending some person out there you can send a person out there you can find an object out there and walk to it but eventually like you said you get to a point where you just don't know where you are on the map anymore and you need to do uh what's called a, a resection i believe it's called a resection or reverse azimuth, azimuth to do that you have to find something on your map that you can also see in the terrain all okay. right. And to do this, you need to do this. You need to find two objects on your map that you can see in the terrain. It might be a building. If the building's on the map and you see it also in the train, that could be one object. If you see the tip of, uh, I don't know, uh, a bend in a river, for example. OK, um, it's a little bit wider. But um, if it's the only thing you can find, you can use that. And uh, you want to you want to do that. So what you would do is you would take your compass and you would point it towards 
let's say if there's a church, you point it towards a church and you get your reading. You go and take that reading then, you go mark it on the map. We'll say, you know, I've been using 240 degrees, you write 240 degrees next to the, uh, the church. Um, and then you want to, remember you gotta subtract for, um, for your declination. So you gotta look down right. the declination diagram and find out if you need to add or subtract um, the degrees and find out, and then you, you, you add or subtract the degrees and that's gonna give you your new azimuth because now we want to, we're using grid north now, right? right. So now right. after you do the, the subtraction, map. yep, after you do your, yep. uh, your addition or subtraction, uh, you're gonna get your azimuth now for the grid location on that map and you're gonna mark it on there. Then you're going to find your second location. You're going to zero in on it again, and you're going to get an azimuth to that location. You're going to aim to the center of it, and you're going to look down, get your reading on your off your compass. Then you're going to look down on top of your um, the object that's on your map, and then you're going to figure out the declination, and you're going to do your addition, subtraction, and you're going to find out the grid azimuth. Okay. Now we got two locations with grid azimuth on it. All right. So if you don't have a protractor, <laughs> okay. This is going to be so we need to have the protractor in the go bag, for sure. You're, you need to. I'm telling you right now. I pulled this right out of my um, my go bag. I keep uh -huh. I keep my Kaminga in there. Yep. I keep um, my compass in there. I have a ruler in there for drawing straight lines on maps okay. if I have to. Um, my bug out locations. I usually print out in advance and I and I laminate them. And I use grease pens, grease markers. Yep. Yeah, because they write in rain, right? Yep, they write in rain and they don't come off. You know, yep. you, you have to rub them off with a cloth. So that's okay. my that's my 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 go bag um, for for land having right there. Those are the items that I have in my in my bag. But uh, so now that you have those items, you're going to need to do some some some, some subtracting to find out where you, what your location is now. So you need to take your compass, and in the middle of your compass, there is a, a little little hole, little dot. You probably can't see it. Um, it's yep. Yeah, we can. Yep. Right. Well, for those listening at home, there's a little hole. Should be a little hole somewhere in the center of your compass. You need to lay that exactly on the uh, one of the objects that you found on your map. All right. And now you have to do what's called reverse azimuth. All right. So now this is I won't don't want to say confusing. But remember, I was talking about positive readings and negative readings. All right, so you got positive right. declination. If you have something that's less than 180 degree reading, you have to subtract 180 degrees from it. You got something. I'm sorry, I said it backwards. You got something that's less than 180 degrees. You had to add 180 degrees to get the exact reverse declination okay. or reverse azimuth. If you got something that's more than 180 degrees, you resubtract it. If you have something that's less than, you add it at 180 degrees. All right, so. What you're going to do then, if you have uh, 200 and uh, you got your calculator out, I don't have my calculator out. 200 and you got one? Got it. All right. Yep. All right. You need a reverse azimuth of 240 degrees. Now, 240 degrees is more than 180, correct? So you need to subtract yes. 180 degrees from 240 degrees to get your reverse azimuth. What is it? Okay, 60. 60. So you write 60 down. And you, you put your, you got your protractor now on your location. You find 60 degrees. On your protractor and you mark it on the outside edge of the pro protractor all right okay so then you remove the protractor and then now you can draw use that ruler or the edge of your protractor or whatever kind of straight edge you have and draw a line from the church or whatever location you found on the map draw a line all the way through to your location just draw a straight line you don't know where you're at but you're just going to draw a straight line backwards okay, okay? from 240 to 60 degrees all right now Let's say your other location was, let me throw a number out there. You say your other location was 100 degrees. Okay, so we're gonna add. So since 100 degrees is less than 180 degrees, you have to add 180 degrees to get the opposite. Which is 280. 280, okay. so write okay. down 280. That is now your reverse, loca reverse location. All right, so now you're going to do the same thing. You're going to take the center of the protractor. You're going to lay it on the, the second item that you found on the map that you can see on, in the train. And you're going to locate, what was it, 280 you said? 280, yep. 280. You're going to locate 280 on your compass, or your protractor, I'm sorry, and mark it. You're going to remove your protractor. And you're going to draw a line from the second object, which was the bit in the river. 
draw a straight line all the way through to 280. And where those two lines intersected is your exact location. That's where you're at. That's where you're at. Okay. So, we got practice to do. We, we got to get out and practice, 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 practice. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but it's really easy if you, if you, once you, um, the declination stuff is probably harder to remember than adding and subtracting the 180. It's easy to remember if it's more than 180, subtract 180, if it's less than 180, add 180. Um, right. But there's only 360 degrees in, in, in the degrees right on a compass. So if you want to get the opposite direction, you just, you got to locate that object out in the distance and draw a line straight, perfectly backwards towards you um, and do that twice. And that both those lines will resect right towards a certain spot on the map. And that spot where they intersect is where you're located. And that's yeah. really cool. You can find your location that way. Yeah. Yeah. Which is super important. Like, uh, you know, just out, we have desolation wilderness up in the Sierras and it's like, you could get lost out there easy. Well, so, if you're in the wilderness, you're not going to find a whole lot of uh, things that you can spot off in the distance. Right? Far off in the lot. distance. Yeah. Right. Your landmarker is going to be very difficult to find. So in those kinds of situations, you just really want to keep on a humping until you can find something or see something, but you want to mm -hmm. hike in a straight line. You don't want to, you know, be uh, bending all over the place. So you want to just keep your line straight, keep your tra trajectory straight. So you all, you always know at least where you're at um, yeah. in a straight line wise, you know, uh, and, and even like to trying to find the mountain peaks, like, Oh yeah, that's this mountain. Well, it could be any mountain, right? So it that doesn't be. really work unless you're, it's like a, has some kind of a really big marker that you can see. It's definitely that one. If you if you got a map that has uh, has uh, um, well, I'm trying to remember the relief I can't remember the term of it but it shows it shows um, the elevation the little elevation lines on the markers mm -hmm. All right, yeah so topographical map topographical yeah. thank you I, yep. I was having a brain fart so if you got a topographical map you know that shows the incline it'd be probably easier to find you can find the steepest most steep mountain out there and, and that you can see with your eyes and find something oh, on your map that has really really steep ridges on it and if you can do that times two, you know you can do it where you know where you're at. Yep. Okay. So that takes us through the bearing because that that's kind of important, you know, when people are out there hiking. So um, how about if you're completely lost in the wilderness, you have a compass, uh, and you can't identify anything like that? Could you just like, you know, set it south, keep walking south and hopefully you find something or is it best to like just hit water and then follow the water? That's what I, I would go to water and then follow the water. Yeah. You but know, and I, I like to watch all those, um, all those, you know, the survival shows, you know, the bear grills, and these different individuals that go out and they, they uh, go out with almost nothing and they talk you through why, why they're doing what they're doing and stuff. But, uh, if you want to stay in a straight line with your compass, you know, and try to head in a, in a in a in an east, easterly or westerly position because water flows north to south right so um eventually you're going to run into some kind of stream or something and you can follow the stream mm -hmm. south and if you follow the stream south then uh, streams generally especially larger streams generally lead to civilization yes yeah for sure like in the sierra nevadas that's ex <laughs> i mean you're, if you find water you're going down the mountain and you're gonna go to civilization i mean find there's a mud just hole. Yeah, there's just no right question. <laughs> yeah, well, in the Sierras, it's nice. If you look at a map of California, it's actually pretty cool, like how all the rivers come off of the Sierra Nevadas and then just like feed out to the cities. It's it's not uh, like the grid system like the Midwest is. It's it's like a pie system, so it's actually kind of kind of trippy. It takes some getting used to when you come out here. You're Someone like, say oh, pie. <laughs> right? Someone say pie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, we still got more to go. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but not during this interview. So I think we covered it. What do you think? Uh, is there anything else that is really, really important that I didn't cue into that we should know uh, when we're out there navigating? No, I think you hit some really important things. You know, um, uh, you just can't take a, a, a map and a compass out there and, and think that you're going to have things uh, straightened out. It's okay, you know. Uh, it's okay to use a map and a compass without doing the declination. If you're not traveling that far, you know, okay. um, if, if you don't get too far out so that, so that you um, lose sight of, of certain, you know, um, things that you can see on the map, you know, location, you know, little markers and things like that. So that you know, where you're at all the time. Then it's, it's okay. You know, like that. Cause you can at least, you know, head in, in a, in a, 
certain direction that's relatively close to where you're going, but it's the long distances, the long tracks that's going to make the big difference. You know, you, you might be, you know, a centimeter off, you know, on your first step, but you're going to be miles off on later on. One. Yeah, yeah, and you won't be able to see um, your destination or anything close to your destination in the end. Um, mm -hmm. That's my point. You know, if you if you if you can see if you're only doing something that's a you know a few you know thousand yards, um, and the train is relatively flat, it's okay to do it that way without without having to do the declination. But you might as well learn it because it's important stuff, and, and it. it is a little bit complicated. So it does take like learning and practice and and uh, you know some dedication there. It's one of those things that you definitely lose um, the knowledge on if you don't rehearse it every once in a while. Yep, because um, I went to uh, um, Michigan United Conservation Camps to, uh, when I was younger, you know, and uh, we did tons of stuff. I knew exactly how to do it out in the woods, anywhere I was. I could realign that compass, go, go, go. And then uh, now I'm like, what? what? How did I do that? What? Now this seems way complicated, like way more complicated than when I was a kid and everything else. So yeah, it takes practice. I remember when I was in the Marines doing this, um, there was, I mean, there's always something you just don't grasp because they throw so much information at you so fast and um, then you got to go out there and practice and stuff. But early on, it's like, I'm so lost. And then you just start through practice. Uh, you begin to, you know, pick things up over time. Yep. Um, I do have a video that, cause like I said, if you don't, um, practice this once in a while or rehearse it or go over it again you lose the information uh it's just one of those things so um for for, for your viewers um anybody that's listening if they want to if you don't mind sarah uh, i will send you a link to a video that it's an older video like a much older video um but it's it's accurate and uh it's i go that's the one i go to all the time to watch and to rehearse Excellent. you know yeah and you can post that you know on your channel and um we'll do it that way yeah, that'd be great. I'll just add it right in the show notes and then they can click right over there because um, this is really important information for, for people to grasp. You can't yes. just grab a map and go. So no. I keep uh -huh. this video in my, in my favorite section because it's, uh, it's that cool. Yeah. Nice. Well, Doug, why don't you go ahead? Uh, you didn't give your website in the beginning, so let people know where they can find you, get a hold of your books, check you out. All right. Yeah. My website is ldouglashogan.com. You can find me on Facebook at Honor Your Oath. Um, I'm also on Amazon, all over Amazon. Uh, so if you just go to Amazon, put L. Douglas Hogan in there, uh, you'll hit me up that way. Do a Google search, L. Douglas Hogan, and you'll find lots of hits because uh, a lot of, I know the podcast interviews that I've done in the past with uh, with Sarah Hathaway is you can, you can dig those up and listen to those as well. Oh yeah. Yeah. They're easy to find. I have a whole uh, survival guide now over on my website and I just have everything gridded out. It's really easy to find the past episodes and stuff now. So uh, I was really happy with that. Uh, took a while to put it together, but it looks so beautiful. So yeah. Super. Alrighty, Doug. Well, thanks so much for your time today. Hey, thank you for having me. All right, Doug. Thanks so much for coming on the show today and sharing your compass knowledge. This is something that we really got to get out and practice. And I say we, because I'm just as guilty as you are. I've got to get out there and I've got to get my compass out and I've got to be practicing how to do this stuff now. Make sure you have your maps in hand now so that when things happen and you might be really in need of that skill, you've got it. Also, it's a great skill to have for if you're ever out in the wilderness, you know, out hiking, hunting, you know, anything like that where you're out in the wilderness for an extended period of time, you should definitely know how to use a compass and do not rely upon GPS. You know, I was out with a survival crew and uh, we were doing this hike and, you know, on the way back, my instructor was like, okay, you guys find your own way back. And I had memorized the whole route in by, by rote as I went because it's just a habit I developed when I was younger and in shady places. So anyway... I had developed this habit, already knew how to get back home, and the one of the other guys was like, oh, no, we'll just follow my GPS. Man, we ended up tracking up rocks, through blackberry bushes, scrambling through all kinds of nasty. And I was like, no, we didn't have to do any of that if we would have just used our brains and not followed a stupid computer. So I definitely um, never buy GPS myself. I don't want to become reliant upon it. Get your map, get your compass. They're not going to fail you. 
you can make a compass too. Where I, I might do another show on that, but uh, you know, you can make your own compass when you're out in the wilderness, and it's better than nothing. I mean, it's not as great as what Doug was displaying on the show today, obviously, but you know, it's better than nothing, and you really need to know how to do this skill without a machine to do it for you. So take the time, get her done, put some practice into it. I want to thank all my subscribers. Once again, I'm moving my Patreon services directly into my website. So if you would like to become a supporter, head on over there to www.authorsarahfhathaway backslash supporter. I'll get you all hooked up. Um, I still got all the merchandise available. You know, I still got some camel hats left and a couple black ones left. And then I still got a few t-shirts left. So head on over there if you want to get hooked up with that before I run out of those. Thank you so much for listening today. You guys are the reason why I sit down and put this podcast together. And, you know, I, not only am I blessed to get to learn all this information along the way, but I'm honored to be able to bring it to you every day and share my stories with you. Or I guess not every day, but every week, right? So until next time, remember, dream, survive, thrive. Thank you for joining Sarah for this episode of the Changing Earth Podcast. Don't forget to pick up your copy of Day After Disaster, Without Land, The Walls of Freedom, Battle for the South, and Dark Days in Denver at www.authorsarahfhathaway.com. If you love Sarah's books and this podcast, please head over to Amazon or iTunes and let everyone know by leaving a review.